Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again, coming to you as always from the ChinaHistoryPodcast.com, your regular source for all the Chinese history fit to podcast. It's a free service brought to you by the fine folks at the Montgomery Foundation. We're in the fifth installment of our Cultural Revolution Overview. I thought we were going to get to Liu Shaoqi and his better half in this episode, but that might be in part six or seven. It's coming up. Today, we focus on a short but action-packed period where chaos reigned and there was high drama with even the great one himself, Mao Zedong, having to step in to act as the decider. But mostly it's Zhou Enlai who has to use the full extent of his prestige and authority to deal with the impossible tasks at hand. Mao was throwing incendiary bombs all over the place, and Premier Zhou had to share Mao on and at the same time run all over the place and put out fires. Today we're going to linger in the crazy and bloody year of 1967. If Mao's objective was to create massive chaos in China, you know, where people were engaging in a whole lot of ultraviolence, he succeeded. You know, there are so many important characters from this cultural revolution period who played a major role at the time. Most of them are forgotten or not well known, at least in the West. Though not headline names today, these characters in their day played a starring role during the lead-up to and in the management of the Cultural Revolution. I thought I would sort of focus in on several of them and introduce them in the context of today's discussion. You know, there's so many people who are coming to the fore, both on the leftist and the conservative side. At this point, what we have in 1967 is all-out warfare between two main factions. And mind you, this is a big generalization, but... It makes the whole thing easier to digest. You had two sides in this whole cultural revolution thing. You had all those who were, you know, okay with how everything was and lined up against them were those who, you know, had some sort of beef with the status quo. It's during this phase, starting in early 1967 and and exploding in the summer of 67, that this fire that Mao started began to burn out of control. And all around the world, while this was going on in China, you know, early to mid-1967, you had the Six-Day War in Israel, Expo 67 in Montreal. This was the time Muhammad Ali refused to go in the army to fight in the Vietnam War. Elvis, who did serve in the army, married Priscilla. 67, it was the last time the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. Sergeant Peppers came out. I remember I was living in Chicago at the time, and I remember summer of 67, that's when Richard Speck was convicted for killing those eight student nurses. This was the time in the USA when the Supreme Court ruled you couldn't prohibit interracial marriage. In my lifetime, there were race riots in the U.S. This was when BBC 1, 2, 3, and 4 were launched uh, that September. We ended last time touching briefly on what became known as the February countercurrent. Now, before we get into that, we won't dig too deep. Let's name some names and get a timestamp as to who they are in 1967. We'll discuss who these people are in the context of, you know, today's episode. I have several names I'll mention. Let's start first with the leftists. We've mentioned him many times, and he's not that well known. There's uh, Chen Boda. Chen Boda was Mao's ghostwriter. He was the director of the CCRG, the Central Cultural Revolution Group. He made it to the standing committee and made it to as high as number four in the party. He was a major force during this period. You hear me mention Chen Boda a lot. Then there's Wang Li. He plays a big role today. He was another ghostwriter in the party and served initially as... Uh, director of the CCP International Liaison Department. He had the right connections, and he ended up succeeding Tao Zhu as head of the propaganda group and got put in the uh, CCRG. He was famous for his fire-breathing speeches and his support to the radical left. He was the day-to-day mover and shaker of the CCRG, and actually, you know, he was actually doing stuff besides currying favor with Mao and you know doing all kinds of self-promotion. 
So he had a nice tragic ending that we won't get into today. There's also a uh, very important today, Xie Fu Zhe. Xie. He was a military man who in 1967, was he was a vice premier and minister of public security. So in a word, he was important. He was the executioner for a lot of senior cadres, an old guard, and had a hand in a lot of bad stuff. And to show you how bad Xie Fu Zhe was, he suffered the same fate as Kang Sheng in that, uh, well, a lot of these guys, he was posthumously thrown out of the party. The others on this leftist side, you all know, Jiang Qing, Kang Sheng, Yao Wen Yuan. And last episode, we were introduced to Wang Hongwen. And also on this team is Zhang Chunqiao. He's the uh, deputy director of the CCRG. Zhang Chunqiao, uh, he, he made it big in the propaganda business. So these guys, among dozens and dozens of others, were the forces of evil or of good, depending on your jiao du. They were the leftists. They were behind the rebels. They were on Chairman Mao's team. They all saw the potential benefits from, you know, an alliance with Mao and all saw something in it for them. But you really have to tread carefully when you throw your lot in with Chairman Mao. One minute you were in and one minute you were screwed. The goal of the leftists in the Cultural Revolution was to seize power from those in charge. You could call those in charge, they were the conservatives. They represented the status quo, you know, whether you loved it or hated it. They had a vested interest in sort of keeping things like they were, you know, namely with them in charge. Although they fought next to Mao during the revolution, once the PRC was established and stabilized after a shaky start, they sort of turn their back on all the theory and principles that used to mean something to them in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. You know, with the People's Republic of China finding its way in the world, you know, they all had better and more important things to do in China than, you know, get mixed up in all this class struggle business. You know, the main guys, these were the founding elites of the party. Liu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, Yang Shangkun, Peng Dehuai, Chen Yun, Chen Yi, Ye Jianying, Li Xianyan, Peng Zhen, Lu Dingyi. I've mentioned all these guys before. Those were the conservatives. Today, we're going to focus in on the Chicago of China, the revolutionary city of Wuhan in centrally located Hubei province. This is where the Wuchang uprising took place on Double Ten Day, 1911, that spelled curtains for the Qing dynasty. So Wuhan, this place was special in China. It's a very important place, sort of, you know, being in the middle and all. It's a strategic hub for just about anything that has to get from one part of China to another. And it's right on the Yangtze River. Remember, July 16th, 1966, this is where Mao made his historic swim. And going back a thousand years, this whole area has been chock full of historic tales and events. So, in a word... It's not the sexiest city in China, but certainly one of the most revolutionary. We're going to look at today the top guy in the Wuhan military region, Chen Zaidao, and his chief lieutenant, Zhong Hanhua, a general, and he's a top leader in the Wuhan politico-military establishment. He was Chen Zaidao's political commissar. These are two respected and professional military men. They were Peng De Huai types, professionals all the way, soldier first, loyal. They knew what honor in the military meant and used many of the same codes of all army men all over the world. So in 1967, the PLA top brass, wherever they are, you know, see everything going on in China. And Lin Biao is totally deconstructing the entire PLA with all these crazy pronouncements. They're trying their best to obey all party directives, which at this point were all coming out of the CCRG. And at the same time, they had to do their job, uh, you know, in the army. The military establishment in such an important region as Wuhan controlled other provinces besides the city of Wuhan and the province of Hubei. And the top guy there, like I said, that was Chen Zaidao. He was the one tasked with maintaining law and order on his turf. 
As in all the previous episodes of this series, the star of today's episode is, of course, Chairman Mao. You know, you could see he was very hands-on during this period. He always knew everything that was going on, or at least the leftist CCRG spin on events. We're going to see Mao make a few missteps, and although he often tried to sound cavalier and, you know, like, you know, whatever went wrong, he thought about it already, and, you know, it wasn't so bad and whatnot. He always had something to say. But by the middle to end of 1967, even Mao knew the truth. You know, no more great leap forward inflating economic figures to pi ma pi with, with uh, Mao. The numbers didn't look good, and the five-year plan was, was off. The chaos of the Cultural Revolution was affecting the economy, including agriculture, of course, you know, in a bad way. All of a sudden, 1960, 1961 seemed like it was only yesterday. Now, on paper, you know, there are all these rules, and the top leaders made all kinds of pronouncements about scaling down the violence, don't use weapons, don't do this, can't do that, but it was no use. No one was paying attention to any of the fine print. The masses just read the headlines of what Mao was saying, or Jiang Qing, or Lin Biao, Chen Boda, Kang Sheng, whatever nonsense these guys blurted out, that's the message that was heard. So that's when all these power seizures begin to happen in cities all over China. Now, I've never run a government myself, but from what I gather, it's a pretty complicated and challenging thing to do, especially if you have a lot of people in the country. Like a lot of things, it's best when you leave the important jobs to people who know what they're doing. Well, the CCRG people and their minions all over China were seizing power and creating a total mess by doing that thing they did, you know, turning the establishment on its head. Things begin to deteriorate so bad that Zhou Enlai has to go to Mao and suggest perhaps, you know, maybe it's not such a bad idea if the PLA sends soldiers into all the ministries. So Mao says, you know, okay, and suddenly civilian government dissolves and you have the PLA in charge of, you know, everywhere to maintain order. What happened to everyone who was previously running the government, well, almost all of them sooner or later got sent down, you know, in 1968 mostly to what were known as May 7th cadre schools, but We'll get into that later. Now, having the military running the government presented some risks to Mao. He wasn't entirely comfortable with the idea. But as long as Lin Biao remained loyal to him and in control of the PLA, he was good. But still, Mao was a man who didn't trust anyone too far, so he had to keep the military from getting too powerful. Let's look at Shanghai for a second and the whole Shanghai Commune. The greatest violence going on in China was in Beijing and Shanghai. In Beijing, the Red Guard violence was led by the students mostly. In Shanghai, though, the students and workers split early on, and the muscle and the brains of the Red Guard rebel movement in Shanghai was led by the workers, who, I'm going out on a limb here, but uh, saying this, but they were much rougher and a much tougher lot than their student brothers and sisters. And as we mentioned in the last episode, Mr. Wang Hongwen, a firebrand leftist worker, he was the Nie Yuanzi of Shanghai in that he is credited with, you know, pasting up that first Dazi Bao, or big character poster, down in Shanghai. The uh, Kangping Road incident, December 30th, 1966, this was led by Wang Hongwen and pitted the radicals against the Shanghai party establishment. It was a terribly violent struggle, and Mao sat on his hands and let the party stalwarts there go down in flames. It also sent a signal to everyone in China who was paying attention that all this violence was okay, and no one had to worry about, you know, getting in any trouble if things got out of hand. Mao wasn't frowning on this at all. January 16th, 1967, the rebels are in full control of Shanghai, and Mao you know, gives it his official thumbs up. And this is the beginning of what became known as the Shanghai Commune, though Mao made them change the name later on to the Revolutionary Committee of Shanghai Municipality. CCRG member Zhang Chunqiao is made the top guy there in Shanghai with Yao Wenyuan as his deputy. And whenever these two guys had to go to Beijing for meetings, which was quite often, their deputy was Wang Hongwen. So you can see how this future gang of four member is already quickly rising to prominence. 
those in the provinces saw what happened in Shanghai. And although, you know, it was quite a violent upheaval, Chairman Mao still said it was okay. So all this violence spread quickly to the provinces of China. And you had similar power seizures like in Shanghai, you know, those running the government were dealt with, you know, in all kinds of ways. And leftist radicals took control of the daily levers of power. Now, the radicals weren't always successful. Many times they were beaten back. It's not like, you know, the ones in charge just laid over and died. This was why you had so much violence and killing all over China. Not everyone wanted to be a Red Guard. Not everyone wanted to turn China upside down. You had plenty of common, everyday people, you know, total and complete ping mean, you know, who felt, what the hell? This is crazy to be doing all this stuff. What's wrong with the way it is? You know, a lot of these people who supported the status quo, they fought back. So sometimes the rebels didn't succeed in trying to seize power from the local government and party officials. But when a power seizure succeeded, like in uh, Heilongjiang, Shandong, Guizhou, Shanxi, Beijing, and elsewhere, the party center, which again was pretty much the CCRG, gave the rebels in charge instant recognition and legitimacy. Now the party center in Beijing, they were having a major struggle with different leftist factions that were all contending for power there. Whenever these high-profile struggles went on, we'll see. Guys are sent in to deal with it, but when it reaches a certain boiling point and no one could solve the problem, you have to call Premier Zhou. Next to having Mao himself come in and decide, the only one in China who could walk in and act as a referee and had that prestige, that was Zhou Enlai. So he got called in to clean up the factional fighting in Beijing and you know, sort out the creation of the new... Beijing Revolutionary Committee, you know, that acted as the new city government. He did this on April 20th, 1967. By the spring of 67, Zhou Enlai starts trying to talk some sense into Mao and convinces him to tone things down with all the red guards and hooligans, you know, getting a free ride on the government, traveling everywhere and creating strain on municipal resources. So Mao finally agrees and announcements start going out that, you know, in so many words, said no more free lunches or, you know, places to flop. Everyone go home, back to your towns, villages, or wherever. You know, and more and more places became marked as, you know, off limits. The fun was over. Most of 1966 and the first half of 67, everyone got to have their fun. Now it was back to work. You know, primary schools were opened. And after a while, the same thing happened with the middle schools and then later on the colleges, you know, back to school for everyone. New rules came out with respect to who you could and couldn't rough up. You couldn't just go after any party official. And the call was sent out to, you know, return whatever property was stolen, you know, from all these Red Guard raids, you know, from whoever. And anyone who talked about forming any national Red Guard organizations were forbidden to do so. You, had, you could only talk local. There was this um, term called rusticated youth, the zhi shi qing nian, zhi qing. These were all educated city youth who got sent down to the countryside, mostly in the 50s, early 60s, to more or less eke out a miserable existence there. They were all able to take advantage of the chaos of the Cultural Revolution and you know the travel freedoms to get back into the cities. But now... They were all being sent back again, you know, and after tasting a few months of the good life, you know, that the cities had to offer, the last thing they wanted to do was go back to their homes out in the sticks. After going off the rails, mining and industry began to be put back to the way it was. The PLA's role in all this cannot be underestimated. They maintained security, law, and order. They were power brokers determining who would and wouldn't get their support for their particular power seizure. If you were a Red Guard group or, you know, coalition and you were looking to overthrow your local party committee, not unless the local PLA garrison supported you did you have any chance. So they played a role in supporting the rebel takeover of the government at the provincial and local level. In 1967, there were all kinds of things coming out from the party center that tried to, you know, make sense of everything. March 19th, you had the three supports and the two militaries campaign announced by the uh, Military Affairs Commission, the MAC. And, of course, Ma was the chairman of the MAC. This campaign said the military supports the three groups that were, you know, the left, 
the peasants and the workers. And it also said the PLA carries out military training and military control. So the PLA is always in the thick of everything trying to restore order. All over China, they fought these battles and refereed these power seizures. And these provincial military leaders had to still support the rebels, but they also had to maintain order. And this was not easy to do and downright impossible in most cases. But after someone or other whispered in Mao's ear about these heavy-handed tactics being taken by the PLA against the rebels out in the provinces, Mao says on April 1st, the... PLA was being too rough, so he takes out their fangs and they can no longer do what was necessary to maintain some semblance of order. Mao had signed the eight-point order of January 28, 1967 that gave all this power initially to the PLA. But now we see again, Mao goes and flip-flops and follows up with this 10-point order of April 6th, and this takes away all the power from the PLA and gives it back to the rebels. And Mao, you know, he had a change of heart. That's all. He was was the chairman. He could do whatever he wanted. So all this time, the PLA had been clashing with rebel groups. Now, with Mao's April 10-point order, now the PLA was on the run. And the rebels were aching to get even. And, you know, that's what they did. Right away, you had a whole spate of anti-PLA riots where, you know, rebels just turned on them. It flared up at once as everyone was looking to get even. Mao tried to intervene and, you know, make nice, but he was ignored. A lot of this was personal. I mean, once you you lit that magnesium, it wasn't so easy to blow out the fire. Now, this was a major headache for the CCRG. They totally needed the support of the, you know, old guard military. Without the PLA backing them up, and this was, you know, Lin Biao's main job, they'd be gone in a second. But the CCRG was also the big brother to all the radical civilian rebels. So they had to show full support always to these guys. This was a difficult balance, you know, these two sides, the supporting the PLA and supporting the rebels, you know, who were now killing each other. You know, the CCRG had to support one or the other. Now, I briefly mentioned this in the last episode at the end. Mao out of sheer frustration at how incompetent the CCRG was, you know, performing, gave them a major dressing down on February 10th, particularly to Chen Boda and Jiang Qing. What triggered this was the way fellow Politburo member and central propaganda group leader Tao Zhu was dragged down. Mao protected him at first, but later on had to let him go. Tao Zhu was replaced by Wang Li, who I mentioned before, and is going to play a starring role later. So Mao snaps at the CCRG in February, which that's what gave these conservative old guard guys the confidence to speak up and, you know, against everything that they saw was degrading society. So they started to fight back, and this short period where the conservatives made this one last-ditch effort to bring this madness to an end. This was known as the February Countercurrent. And those who led the charge were, you know, Vice Premiers uh, Ye Jianying, Chen Yi, Tan Zhenlin, Li Xiannian, as well as the military stalwart uh, Xu Xiangqian. What followed were two extremely heated meetings between these two groups. This was members of the CCRG and then these old guard legends, these military men, wanted to know if the CCRG intended to dispose of the central government just like it allowed Shanghai to fall. They also inquired if every single senior leader was to be disposed of. And lastly, they wanted to know, was the PLA to be destabilized? What resulted was just a verbal brawl. And in the heat of the moment, you know, things were said that maybe, you know, shouldn't have been said. Ye Jianying would screamed at Chen Boda that, you know, he, meaning the CCRG, that he had, that Chen Boda headed, had made a mess of the party, a mess of the government, a mess of the factories and the countryside. And now he was making a mess of the army as well. These marshals and vice premiers really thought because of who they were, you know, their relationships with Mao going back to the beginning, that they had the chairman on their side. 
but they didn't. All the angry words spoken up in those two meetings were reported back to Mao by his CCRG people, and they rushed to meet Mao you know, before Premier Zhou got to him, and they just spoon-fed Mao all the details, you know, in such a way that they knew were sure to infuriate him. And, you know, he did get angry, and he felt betrayed that, you know, his old comrades were so against him on this. But worst of all, and to this day, he is criticized for this, Zhou Enlai did not rise to their defense or join in on the demand to use reason and practical measures to manage the country. Zhou sat on his hands, and probably for good reason. He knew exactly where Mao stood on this, and to support Marshals Chen, Xu, Ye on this matter was to invite a certain confrontation with Mao. So Mao turned on them, and they were all now on the defensive. And all throughout China, the old guard of the PLA and all those who saw allowing radicals without military experience to take over the day-to-day management of the PLA and to politicize the army like they were, this was not a good thing. And with Mao's latest pronouncements in April, the 10-point order, he was allowing these radicals to struggle with the army and, you know, to hold all this authority to seize power from the established order. This all leads up to the Wuhan incident of July 20th, 1967. This is where the Cultural Revolution reached a kind of tipping point where the whole thing began to descend into civil war. In the fall of 1966, there were two Red Guard factions in Wuhan. By January 67, there were more than 50 the Wuhan Revolutionary Rebel General Headquarters was formed to carry out the seizure of power in Wuhan and Hubei. This coalition split up from the start into three groups, called the Steel-Tempered Second Headquarters, Steel-Tempered Workers General, and the Steel-Tempered September 13th Factions. The Wuhan Steel-Tempered Three, they were called. They were, you know, organized and itching for a fight. Chen Zaidao was wise to what was going on. And he wasn't going to let the whole Wuhan and Hubei military apparatus fall into rebel hands. And he wasn't going to allow Wuhan to degrade into anarchy. He took control of all the most sensitive parts of the government, you know, the broadcasting stations, banks, granaries, warehouses, you know, etc. And of course, all the while they did this under the guise of, you know, supporting the revolutionary masses, Chen and Zhong Hanhua, had met with Mao and Zhou, and the message they got from the meeting, which was the wrong message, was to do whatever possible to support the masses, most of all the leftists, and to maintain order. Uh, Tall order, indeed. They thought Mao meant maintain order as the first priority and allow the leftists to rampage, you know, as second in importance. But with Mao, it was always the other way around. Chen Zaidao had two or 3,000 leading rebels and the steel-tempered workers general arrested and carries out actions that more or less lead to a collapse of the main radical groups. And to make sure there was no cancer from within, action was taken to root out any radical elements within the PLA, too. Mao was hoping there'd be a close cooperation between the PLA, the old guard, and the rebels. But instead, what happened was the PLA and the old guard were you know, teaming up to silence and marginalize the rebels. So when Mao did his flip-flop thing on April 6th with a 10-point order and sided against the generals and in favor of the leftist rebels, it was a major cause for concern for Chen Zaidao. And after all these PLA crackdowns, the resulting wave of attacks against the PLA were immediate and violent. Chen was also subject to all kinds of efforts to bring him down they even called him the uh, Tan Chen Lin of Wuhan. Tan Chen Lin was prominent in the uh, February countercurrent, and the past actions of the Wuhan military region leaders were being compared to the actions taken by Chen Yi, Ye Jian Ying, Tan Chen Lin, etc., back in February. They were going against the grain. The rebels in Wuhan at once began their attempt to seize power in the city. They got control of the newspapers. Chen Zaidao and Zhong Hanhua met with the CCRG on April 16th to sort this out. It seemed that the CCRG was, you know, going to see things their way and show some sympathy, you know, for their reasoning. But their soft line on the Wuhan military region leaders was leaked to 
conservative elements in Wuhan, and in no time at all, word spread that the CCRG was lining up with the military region folk, and when this got back to Jiangqing, that someone leaked the outcome of the meeting. You know, whatever was decided was rescinded, and there was no deal. The CCRG pulled their support. In fact, there was no deal either way, so no one knew what was up in Wuhan. So in mid-May, the two opposing sides in Wuhan began to draw their battle plans. And here enters the Million Heroes, the Baiwan Xiongshi. This faction was about half a million strong. They supported Chen Zaidao and the way he was handling everything. The core of this group was comprised of everyone who had a reason to maintain the status quo. This included party members, government officials, youth leagues, you know, older workers and militiamen and others. Lined up against them were all those rebels and factions that didn't have it so good, you know, pre-1966, they wanted anything but the status quo. The Million Heroes also made it known in one way or another, as far as this whole, you know, cultural revolution thing was concerned, it was all fine and well, but they didn't really need it down where they were in Hupe. In May and all of June, these two main factions clashed in a series of very bloody and gory confrontations. The weapons of the day were lances and knives, and it was nasty hand-to-hand combat most of the time. The Million Heroes aggressively moved against the rebels in their attempts to seize back buildings and whatnot that had been seized by the rebels since April. And orders from Beijing to cool it and settle down were ignored. On June 24th, another appeal from the party center came to not use weapons and to settle down, but it went unheeded. And on that day, June 24th, the Million Heroes, in a deadly show of force, they captured the rebel workers' revolutionary headquarters. And keep in mind, it's not like everyone had a dog in the fight. A lot of people were fighting on both sides simply as mercenaries for money or, you know, for some other reason. This wasn't anything related to class struggle or revolution. It was all about preserving and seizing power. By the end of June, the Million Heroes were in total control, and they had to beat a lot of heads to attain power in Wuhan. Things then cooled down, and the CCRG called the representatives from both sides to come to Beijing and let's settle this whole thing. But then suddenly Chairman Mao says, forget it, he'll go down to Wuhan. But, you know, because of who he was and all, and because of the dangerous and unstable situation in Wuhan, you know, he'd go down there secretly and allow Xie Fuzhi and Wang Li to serve as the voice of the party center, you know, and do all the negotiations. Zhou Enlai also, you know, his physical presence in Wuhan was kept a secret, except, you know, from a core few at the top of the Wuhan military region leadership. Zhou talks to Chen Zaidao and Zhong Hanhua, and it falls to... Xie Fuzhi and Wang Li to go talk to the rebels. And to add to the tension, a bunch of Red Guards had also just flown in from Chongqing to stir things up and jump into the fray. Xie Fuzhi, you know, Minister of Public Security, he had been flying all over China trying to keep things from spiraling out of control. You know, he had his hands full. The presence of such party center luminaries from Beijing as, you know, Xie Fuzhi and Wang Li was supposed to have been kept a secret. Everything was very tense, and the last thing anyone wanted was to spark some incident or attract attention while things were, you know, being worked out. But Xie and Wang somehow weren't careful, and they got noticed, and of course, everyone knew who they were, you know, and where they stood on everything. So if you were sympathetic to the Million Heroes, these were the bad guys. So they got noticed, and even though Joe told these guys to lay low. So their presence suddenly, out of nowhere, serves as a lightning rod for both factions to vent their spleen, and things in Wuhan get hot real fast. And the whole existing conservative political military establishment was in full self-preservation mode. And, you know, they saw themselves as being unfairly targeted and being painted into a corner. They were not going to back down in the face of these rebels, and they made it clear they didn't care who said what, not even what the premier said. Despite all that, there were a series of stormy meetings between July 15th to 18th, headed by Zhou Enlai, of course, and both sides, you know, really let the other one have it. On July 18th, the big showdown comes, and Zhou takes Chen Zaidao and Zhong Hanhua to go see Mao, who, as I said, was already in Wuhan. 
Mao plays this one, you know, in such a way that he tells him, yeah, you know, just write a confession. Let's not make a big deal. You know, this will all go away. So the way it ends, you know, it seemed both, both sides were happy. Now, although it seemed like the Wuhan military region leaders weren't exactly backing down, you know, in a way it could have been spun that way. And so that is indeed what happened. Xie Fu went straight to his people and, and said, uh, you know, Chan Zaidao had backed down and, you know, Mao had sided with the leftists on this issue. And word spreads like wildfire. July 18th, 19th, about this, you know, so-called capitulation on the part of Chan Zaidao. And then to turn this into a complete spectacle... All the rebels start gloating and, you know, fiery inflammatory speeches were given by Xie Fu and Wang Li. When all was said and done, Chen Zaidao later admitted it was those speeches by Xie and Wang that directly led to the Wuhan incident. That night, July 19, 1967, Xie Fu and Wang Li faced down the top Wuhan military region top brass, and among other things, you know, talked down to them, spoke arrogantly to them, and, you know, demanded they make a 180-degree turn on, you know, where their loyalties lie. And all the while, outside the gates of the military region headquarters compound, you know, where the meeting was taking place, a crowd of million heroes began to gather, which, you know, soon numbered in the thousands, and they blocked the gate, and they were all screaming out, you know, all kinds of angry demands. The problem started... When the speeches given by Xie Fu Jer and Wang Li were broadcast to the nation. Now these million heroes demanded that Wang Li come out and explain himself with, you know, what he meant by those inflammatory words he said. Wang Li, you know, in so many words, tells him to piss off. Remember, this guy is central government stuff. He's not some provincial, so he's not going to give in to these guys. The leaders that, you know, quietly exit the headquarters and head to the guest house where, you know, everyone was holed up. Chen Tsai Dao meets with Xie Fu Zhe, you know, to try and sort things out and find some way to put out the fire. But then suddenly a huge mob of million heroes tracks them down and angrily demands to see Wang Li. And Chen Tsai Dao, you know, diffuses the situation and promises, you know, hey, I'll get you Xie Fu Zhe to come see you the next day. And this placates them for the time being. Then... The angry mob, you know, elements of the mob, it became unruly and Chen Tsai Dao himself is attacked and he's blamed for, you know, backing, why'd you back down to Mao? And someone then tracked down Wang Li and they kidnap him and they drag him back to the, you know, military region headquarters where the meeting had just been held, you know, where they just wail on him and beat him and they break his leg. Xie Fu Zhe, you know, runs to tell Mao what's going on. He says they got Wang Li. And then he demands that uh, Chen Tsai Dao go deal with this and get Wang Li back safe. Chen was still out of action at this point, you know, from the beating that had just taken place. So Zhong Hanhua goes instead. Now up in Beijing, Lin Biao and other CCRG elements start spreading rumors that, ah, you see Chen Tsai Dao, he's attempting to launch a coup. And therefore, late in the night of the 20th, in fact, it was the 21st, 2 in the morning. The top leaders, they all depart for Shanghai. And Mao couldn't have been too happy being, you know, the big guy and all, having to flee for his safety in the middle of the night. Xie Fu Zhe and Zhong Hanhua failed to get Wang Li released. However, some high-ups in the military region top brass, they managed to pull a few strings and was able to get Wang Li transferred to a safe place at Air Force headquarters in Wuhan. And then in the wee hours of July 22nd, Wang Li and Xie Fu Zhe fly back to Beijing. Zhou Enlai uh, flies back as well from where he was, and he's there to triumphantly greet them as those two, uh, Xie Fu Zhe, Wang Li, arrive at the airport in Beijing. Meanwhile, back in Wuhan, things were out of control. The Wuhan military region headquarters had been taken over by million heroes elements. The first thing the CCRG did after Xie and Wang spilled their guts about everything and everything about, you know, the million heroes, Chen Tsai Dao, Zhong Hanhua, you know, the first thing they did was to brand this so-called July 20th incident as a counter-revolutionary revolt. Then... On July 23rd, Zhou Enlai tells these guys they have to come to Beijing to face the music. They follow orders and they go up there the next day. July 25th, there's this huge 
Tiananmen Square rally, standing room only crowd, million people on hand to welcome back Wang Li and Xie Fu Zhe, you know, after their ordeal down in Wuhan. The entire top leadership, except Mao, was on hand for this rally, and it was lost on no one in the military that's standing on the viewing platform with the CCRG, who backed the leftist rebels, was none other than Lin Biao, who showed once and for all that he stood with the CCRG and not with his PLA brothers in arms. The next day, on the 26th, Chen Tsai Dao, Zhong Hanhua, and 10 other officers from the military region were struggled something fierce by top representatives of the Politburo, MAC, and the CCRG. The proceedings were led by Xie Fu Zhe, and a man we'll be hearing a lot about later. This was General Wu Fa Xian, the commander of the Air Force. These whole proceedings were, even by farcical standards, a farce of a farce. No one from Wuhan was allowed to speak in their defense. They were just hammered relentlessly and insulted. And Jiang Qing, too, you know, was screeching at them and, you know, piling on with everyone else. And these guys, you know, are military top brass. And who is she? You know, Mao's wife. But they had to take it. And it's said that when Wu Fa Xian slugged Chen Zai Dao during an intense session, Chen Yi and Tan Chen Lin stood up and walked out. To add on top of this, the CCRG allowed some of their goons to go rough all these Wuhan guys up, you know, later on. July 27th, the next day, it was all over. Chen Tsai Dao and Zhong Hanhua were dismissed, and there was a complete makeover carried over at the Wuhan military region. They totally cleaned house there, and soon afterwards, the whole million harrows movement just, you know, collapsed and died. The rebels were victorious and had beaten back the million heroes and the established order. A new revolutionary government was now set up in Wuhan with the leftists in charge. And as soon as this was a fait accompli, the retribution killings began. And Hubei alone, 184,000 people who were, you know, with the million heroes or supportive of them, were hunted down by the rebels and persecuted, many of them beaten to death. Once the rebels had taken control of the military region power structure, they began to raid the weapons depot and began arming themselves. And what happened in Wuhan was happening, albeit on a smaller scale, all throughout China. It was open civil warfare all throughout 1967 and into 1968. And just when a comforting word or some assurance would have been nice, Jiang Qing goes and opens up her big mouth and says in a well-publicized remark, attack with reason, defend with force. Everyone, you know, made of this whatever they wanted. And like so often before, it inflamed matters and resulted in more violence and more death. Mao, in the meantime, must have been thinking, you know, what could he do to make matters worse? He felt that as much as 75% of the whole military was still controlled by these, you know, old guard forces sympathetic to Chen Tsai Dao's line of reasoning. So amidst all that was beginning to happen with all this armed violence, Mao says, let's arm the leftists so that the fight for control of the military is more even. You know, you can say this might have been... Mao's, you know, knee-jerk reaction coming on the heels of what had just gone down in Wuhan. The man, you know, who coined the phrase, power grows out of the barrel of a gun, was, you know, more scared than ever of a possible PLA revolt. So he had to make sure they was on his side. Wang Li got sent back to what was now rebel-friendly Wuhan to oversee the arming of the leftists there. The arming of the left began first in Wuhan and uh, also in uh, Hunan province. This was Another one of those things that everyone thought was really a bad idea. But despite, you know, everyone's misgivings, no one was anxious to rock the boat with Mao at such a time. So all these leftists who had just got their faces kicked in by the conservatives were never more than now itching for a little old-fashioned retribution and ultraviolence. And to top it all off now, thanks to Chairman Mao and his infinite wisdom, were being armed with weapons and ammo. And best of all, they had the chairman's full support. The whole arming of the left was carried out in August 1967. This led to, you know, something like 30, 40 clashes a day. And this was going on all over China. A Wuhan-style revolt was also going on in Hangzhou and to a lesser extent in Chongqing. And not even Mao's 
direct interference in these affairs could quell the fighting. The factions were at war with each other, and this was wreaking havoc on China's industrial production and the economy in general. $40 million earmarked for grain imports got diverted to import steel instead due to the drop in production. You know, this is the kind of stuff that was beginning to happen everywhere. And although this will be a future topic for another day, as all this was going on in the summer of 67, you also had the Hong Kong riots. They had broken out in the spring of 67 and went on until October that year. And as with most out-of-control matters, Zhou Enlai got called in to put out the flames. He had to tell all these hot-headed pro-China leftists in Hong Kong to cool it already. Anyway, I'll cover this in detail uh, another time. On August 22nd, 1967, the CCRG let fly some ultimatum to the British Embassy in Beijing to release, you know, certain prisoners who had been convicted in Hong Kong on terrorism charges. And the British, you know, in so many words, told them to stuff it. And the next thing you know, you had an angry mob of around 10,000 people surrounding the embassy there. It's in Beijing. And, you know, the phone lines were cut. 10.30 p.m., a flare is shot in the air as a signal, and the mob just storms the embassy. There were 18 men and five women, you know, are inside the embassy, and they all cram into this panic room or whatever. And the building is torched, and all kinds of documents and equipment was stolen. The British embassy people somehow escape through a secret tunnel, but when they emerge... They, you know, stick out like a sore thumb and they're instantly recognized by the crowd and they're set upon. And before they're torn to bits, some brave PLA soldiers find a way to escort them to safety. But, you know, one British embassy official uh, uh, later died of uh, his wounds. The whole matter of Hong Kong was a big open wound that got all infected during this time, during the Cultural Revolution. 1967 saw the worst of it. Well, we're uh, way beyond our normal podcast episode length, so let's just put the bookmark back in. We'll pick up with uh, more action next time. For now, this is your humble host and narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, wishing you all the very best. I'm signing off from America's Playground, good old Las Vegas, Nevada. Lasso Wejiasu. I'm here at the Aria, high above city center on the Las Vegas Strip. Back in Cali tomorrow after the usual drive through the Mojave Desert and a Europlate at the Mad Greek in beautiful Baker, home of the world's tallest thermometer. Join me next time, if you please, for another explosive episode of the Cultural Revolution podcast. Take care, everyone.